Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Healthcare India, and today we'll be talking to Mr. Prasant Madhavna, who is the co-founder of Fido AI. Now, Fido AI provides an AI ML platform which uses deep tech and medical research and combines it together to automate the underwriting which is required in healthcare and life insurance schemes. So I was really looking forward to this conversation, and we really discussed in some very insightful points. So without any delay, let's get right into it. Good evening, everyone. Today we have Mr. Prasant Mandapna uh, among us, and uh, he's the co-founder of a company called Fedo, and he has a lot of accolades behind him. He has been in the healthcare and wellness uh, sector for a very long time now, and uh, he's also AI and ML enthusiast. And uh, you know, uh, instead of me speaking about what all he has done, we would really like to know, sir, what are your uh, endeavors with Fedo? and uh, how this shift into the healthcare and wellness sector okay so um, uh, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity i'm happy to talk to you all of you and this is a very interesting uh, uh, way and uh, uh, by means where you can help people in understanding what happens in the industry and connecting it to the academics mm. um, uh, what you are doing is commendable uh now going back to an introduction about me um i've been working for the last i mean i started my work maybe around uh, 20 years uh mostly working in uh, innovation and change management roles mm-hmm. worked in india us and uh, europe with companies like general motors accenture etc and around uh, three and a half four years back i decided to do something specifically on health and wellness mm-hmm. Now, to start with this, I was always a, a fan of uh, using uh, either a wearable device or uh, any other way which you can motivate you to be healthy and, uh, uh, or rather, keep track of it so that you don't miss your exercises, etc. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> that is when we started about this. When we thought, okay, let me, <coughs> excuse me, let me start something on fitness, uh, health, and fitness, whereby you can measure your health. And use it for to improve yourself. So that is where my company Fido um, comes from, and we have developed this score called Fido Score. Now I think um, a lot of you would have been uh, um, or are aware of uh, FICO credit score, like TransUnion or a civil mm. score. Mm. It is required when you apply for a loan or a credit card, mm. which shows the your how good you are with your finances. Mm-hmm. And uh, similarly, is there a measure for your health? And that is where Fido score comes in. Uh, if you go search Google um, health scores, and you will get maybe um, thousands or more uh, links where you can figure out your health, or maybe a health mm-hmm. score or a fitness score. Now, how how is uh, Fido score different from all of them? Now, Fido score. Calculate your risk for future diseases, or it says that how risky are you to get a set of diseases, and if you get such diseases, and what is your propensity to claim or get hospitalized over the next few years because of these diseases, and to find out what we do is we um, the inputs we take are your um, height, weight, your gender, races. Uh, whether you smoke cigarette, drink alcohol, exercise patterns, sleep patterns, and your family history. So around 10 to 12 questions will be asked. Mm. Now this is, uh, and to build this, what we did is, uh, we started with uh, 250 plus medical studies, applied this over a very clean database in the US, and then collected over the last three and a half years, we collected over uh, 75 million records, of which 23 million records are from India. So we are able to predict the risk of an individual for various diseases with over 85% accuracy from the set of data. Now the question comes is, uh, what would happen if I say, I, I mean, I'm gonna say that I don't smoke, okay. but I just don't want to disclose that. Is there, is there a way you can figure it out? So that is our second uh, version where we could identify from your photograph whether you are a chronic smoker or not, what is your BMI, what is your body fat percentage, age, gender, et cetera, so that the number of persons asked will be less. 
Now this all comes into your score and say that, okay, you have a Fido score, which ranges from zero to thousand, where a thousand score in a Superman and zero is a dead guy. And what we believe is a score of 600 and above is considered to be a healthy individual of that group. Um, so uh, now the question is, how do we take this to the market? An algorithm which could predict your future health risk is useful for um, uh, insurance companies uh, giving your medical and your life insurance. Um, pharmaceutical companies would love to use this data to predict diseases and uh, plan their supply chain. Uh, government could use this to plan uh, resources uh, or especially, uh, I mean, COVID is also a different uh, phenomena, but this kind of data could be used to uh, predict what kind of a flu strains would come in so that your flu shots could be administered. So there are multiple use cases. Now it could be for the insurance companies or it could be the, for the healthcare or for the public health. Uh, our offering remains the same. We predict the risk of an individual for various diseases and his propensity to claim over the next few. So, uh, yeah, that's amazing. That's actually a really amazing like concept, and I, I would like to see it, you know, everywhere, like working out everywhere, you know, getting my own pedo score at some point. Talking about uh, health insurance, uh, my next question is on that: ki, uh, What kind of AI applications are emerging in, to, uh, you know, improve health insurance efficiency? and optimization and how is this uh, you know healthcare market uh, how is the healthcare market implementing these ai applications into it okay so healthcare is a very vast market and uh, how uh, ai and ai also have multiple uh, mm. uh, different uh, versions to it or uh, use cases to it so um, uh, while i'll not be able to touch upon every um, topic in this uh, short interaction. Uh, the One of the better ones or the more sexiest uh, use case of AI is using uh, for robotic surgeries happening. People are doing a surgery, sitting out of Lenten to a, a patient in, uh, in an Indian hospital. It could all be possible. Mm. So uh, those are the uh, more sexy or interesting one. You can also see uh, it being used for prosthetics. Mm. So the other day there was a, uh, uh, a video uh, which shared by, uh, I think Elon Musk, right? A monkey playing games using his thought. Neuralink, so all yeah. those, yes, the, yes. So all these things have been happening and AI is a watch subject. The way how people are using for each of those uh, situations is unique. Mm. We have um, investing uh, startups like uh, Sictuple, uh, mm. sorry, Niramai, which uses AI to predict breast cancer, breast cancer. at uh, a fraction of the cost, uh, which was earlier, which is a good incent, uh, good initiative. So there are multiple use cases. Mm. Uh, we remain at the top where we will say that, okay, I'll tell you how uh, healthy this person is and if he has risk for any of those diseases. So here we are not getting into the clinical side yet. We would stay above that and say that, okay, just because I say you have high risk of uh, disease, you don't run to a doctor or start taking medicine. Mm -hmm. You can go take a medical test, get an, um, maybe a lifestyle change would help you being healthy. So this is just an indicator there. But there are places where you take it at each of those levels, going from uh, which we believe is in the top or the more of the top of the funnel, as we call it. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, the robotics and the uh, chip chips, which are a really deep technology used at mm -hmm. uh, uh, different places. So in between, there are multiple other options. You can read, mm, not even getting into the uh, into artificial intelligence. You can see like earlier you had to wait for a uh, I don't know whether you have taken an X-ray and waited for the film to come so that you can take mm -hmm. it to the doctor. You don't, you don't require any anymore. Yeah. So there are a lot more things happening. And once the data is all there and clean and digitized, and that is when the artificial intelligence start to pick it up from there. Mm -hmm. And there is a long way to it, but there are in silos, there are a lot of companies coming in and making specific use cases. So if I make like a proper funnel out of it, so 
suppose there's this company which is collecting patient data from across the country they actually want to uh, you know find like every person's data be it you know his uh, medication history or you know whatever signs and symptoms that he has they're collecting it to make into make it into a bundle then they come to feedo get their feedo score and understand ki chalo you know might there might be a possibility suppose for diabetes then they go into someone like you know so there are companies like artelus which tell you if you uh, you know might get blindness if you have diabetes retinopathy so they go through that so it it's like slowly forming a system like throughout yeah that's that's and that's uh, question yes the other question which you also mean who is going to be the owner of this repository if you ask yeah is it good enough for uh, i mean uh, can a private company take this or the government would be doing uh, something mm. uh, i think you are aware of the uh, that india government is trying to bring in e source program which could be where they would be owning the data mm. while uh, others could connect it to it and run their own algorithms to use it we'll have data hubs like of our own and then yeah yes like upi the infrastructure is there if mm-hmm. i want to launch a uh, wallet like uh, google pay mm-hmm. all i need to do is develop a app and that's it i connect it to the infrastructure i can make a payment on that towards you okay. so yes uh, government is also bringing in some uh, interesting uh, concepts where the data would be with the government in a good format yeah. so that people um, companies can come in and use the data for the betterment of the health of the individuals mm-hmm. right. so uh, going on to my next question uh, what do you think are the factors that determine the successful implementation of an ai model because you know we see like a lot of ai models these days people are working on various projects but how will you define what are the factors which are you know the defining factors for its successful implementation okay so uh, again uh, it depends on which layer are you in that fellow mm-hmm. so uh, i say that okay i came with 85% accuracy it means that uh, when i go with 15 people maybe 15 of them if i uh, run my score 100 times maybe there could be a case that 15 people would get a wrong uh, Mm, prediction or maybe a wrong score hmm. now is this okay so for an insurance company this might be okay hmm. because i would still have a better accuracy than what the doctor is prescribing as of now with the same set of data but uh, think of it into the robotic surgery which we are talking about now here 99 for even if you are 99% accurate you hmm. still one person might die Hmm. which was a case with uh, i think doctor uh, this is an indian uh, indian origin doctor based out of uh, london was uh, recently I mean was prosecuted a year back because he was doing a robotic surgery and then somewhere in between the power went off okay and that uh, the patient died i think his name is prem levchandi um, we will have to google that forgot the name but something happened so this he would have done that surgery maybe hundreds of times uh, mm. using a 3d model or um, done in, um, on a simulator multiple times mm. but once he did an actual situation there was one it was a minor maybe a second power loss so based on each of those use cases how you define the model to be successful has mm. to be is different i'll give you an another example uh, a model which what we are doing which use data to uh, predict the risk of an individual i cannot also overcompensate for my data if i create a 100 percentage match then my data is biased so that way also there is when you are talking about the percentages there are uh, this is a more deeper uh, conversation we need to have and it varies by each of those use cases mm. but i would say okay you make it for as much as possible use ethical use of data you are seeing that things are being uh, taken care and you know the risk before it is uh, implemented yeah. so uh, like personally this question is a personal question for you what are the ai technologies that you know you are most looking forward to in the future of you know health tech 
so for us it is uh, i mean we use ml uh, mm. neural networks for um, i mean day in and day out you also use computer vision for uh, identifying uh, the set things from the photograph we are also now able to figure out your pulse and the spo2 from a video mm. which is now getting implemented to the system so these are some of the things which we are using for our specific uh, use case but if you think of ai it could be different absolutely so like uh, you know ai technology is a very uh, vast thing to talk about in itself it has a lot of you know uh, different kinds of uh, like applications there are a lot of technologies associated with it so uh, like because you uh, you know fido works so closely with the insurance uh, industry right so providing health insurance so what other ai technologies do you think can be used to you know help these industries like the indo- insurance industry and to be specific so the uh, okay the use case for ai in uh, uh, health and life insurance let me talk uh-huh. to start with the health which is um, basically about uh, people are using machine learning to understand the risk of the individual coming in which is something which we are also doing a mm. uh, lot of this data is been used so that the insurance could be uh, personalized yeah. now what is so now every insurance policy is remaining same <clears throat> maybe if both of us go take a policy we will mm. be having a similar premium maybe when you would definitely get a lower premium compared to me Mm-hmm. but there is not going to be a significant difference if you are thinking of it mm-hmm. because it is mostly uh, a very uh, plain vanilla products used but mm-hmm. can there be a specific insurance policy for uh, a specific set of person mm-hmm. you are uh, maybe you are a biking enthusiast or a hiking uh, you mm-hmm. might there could be a specific uh, policy for you so that kind of a personalization is not yet there so uh, ai and data maybe let me say before we even talk about ai the data and basic machine learning uh, algorithms could start helping move into a specific uh, yeah. uh, or a personalized insurance uh, there are uh, the companies like kitos uh, lemonade is while it is not in health mm-hmm. it is a general insurance those are the companies which are uh, big gone ai in insurance space okay. uh, apart from ai people are also using uh, blockchain technology uh, for uh, mostly uh, in the general health I mean, sorry the general insurance category like uh, yeah. you missing a flight yeah. alliance does that in uh, uh, europe where uh, you have a ticket and you have a taken a uh, policy the Uh, flight missing policy hmm. you walk to the airport you miss the flight all you need to do is call up this guy or use the app to log into the site hmm. so basically the system knows that okay the system will connect it to the uh, flight database saying that okay this guy is I mean, the flight is already gone and hmm. he is not in the passenger list you are saying okay my location says i am in the same city as i was supposed to take the flight so all this is connected uh, and uh, through a distributed ledger and you get your uh, claim immediately less than taking less than a minute so no, insurance is not the the best adapter or a, of uh, technology but yeah. it is coming slowly there so that's like blockchain was something that i was about to ask you uh, like my next question is uh, like you know there are a lot of cryptocurrencies we recently studied about you know how blockchain is being used in uh, you know this healthcare sector so what how do you think that you know there are cryptocurrencies again like medshares which are again uh, you know insurance uh, like helping the mutual insurance sector in general and uh, for uh, medical purposes so how do you think blockchain and cryptocurrency this this sector will be helping uh, the you know healthcare as well as uh, the medtech in, in general okay so i'm uh, not an expert in blockchain so i might uh-huh. not be the right guy to explain this but with what i understand one of the use cases uh, uh see if i uh, people consider their health and uh, uh, health data or medical data very personally mm-hmm. so even if i'm a close friend of yours i don't maybe don't want to say, disclose that any i have any of the diseases mm-hmm. now distributed ledger could be used so that your um, identity is also not left your uh, um 
uh, your personally identifiable information is safe, but the data is able to be shared mm -hmm. by various stakeholders. It could be the uh, pharmacy next to you, to the hospital, to the insurance company, to your personal doctor. If it could be done, yes, maybe useful. Uh, but that is all I would be, I mean, anything more I say would be a guesswork. I won't be the right guy to answer that question. So uh, I'll ask you a question, which will be perfect to answer now. Uh, you have been someone who's been into AI and ML, then you shifted into healthcare, right? You wanted to do something in this sector. No, actually, I'm not, a, I'm not an engineer. I yeah. <laughs> have zero knowledge about the, uh, the technology. Yeah. So uh, what I was asking is that, suppose we are in the healthcare sector, we are learning, we are uh, you know, med school graduates or you know someone who's in pharmaceutical industry. Now these students, how important is for them to you know grasp on the you know these technologies as fast as possible to be ready to work with them? Is it important that they learn or the current knowledge that they're getting is you know enough for them? Because you know these technologies are climbing up day by day. So every day there has been some or the other growth in these technologies. So do students of the you know, healthcare sector also need to be you know, at par with these technologies or is it fine like because only institutions will be working with them. So there will always be people who you know, know how to work. So this is a, a slightly, uh, 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 it's a tricky question definitely. It also depends on what do you want to do in your life. <laughs> so uh, I mean, while I wouldn't know what uh, Okay, a pharmacy, okay, you're a student of a pharmacy, you're a right. student of pharmacy. I think your career progress would be to move up to a pharmaceutical company yeah. where I mean, that could be your career growth. I don't know what would be the, uh, the roles which you would be getting into. Uh, so uh, I can give an example of, uh, in my case, okay, I do, I mean, I started with finance. What, how knowledge of technology helped me uh, move to a different uh, sector. I won't say that it has advanced or uh, I've made a lot of uh, progress with that. But okay, as an accountant, I had my option to uh, stay within my finance and accounting sector, uh, move up the ladder so that I would be maybe at this point of time, I would be uh, I mean, somewhere in a, uh, in a good position within the finance industry. It's a high pay, highly paid sector and not a question, not a problem. The other option is what does that interest you? Am I uh, a person who would love to get into a, or am I detail oriented to get into and understand the accounting piece of it? Mm -hmm. uh, there is nothing wrong with that, but maybe I'm, my idea or I'm genetically wired to do something different. Mm -hmm. So because I had the exposure to understand systems or computers, I moved into that different career altogether. Yeah. Now, if I remain within my organization, I would still be in a good position. Uh, but the, I am doing something which I like. Yeah. Now, this is your point. I would I mean, I wouldn't say if I remained in the accounting and I was still working, I would be getting similar salary as what I would be getting, or maybe slightly I'm getting better, maybe if yeah. I move into this uh, career path. But I would love every moment of my life. Now, similarly for a pharmaceutical guy, what is that is going to interest you? I have an MPharm guy in my organization uh -huh. who's uh, as a data analyst with this. Uh -huh. So he's understanding the data or moving towards a data science uh, profession or a career level where he understands the data Mm. Uh, and then see how it could be used for a specific use cases. Now, his knowledge about pharmacy and uh, the medicines and something, whatever you have learned over the period on the healthcare, is helping him in this particular room where we are developing the healthcare uh, or our algorithms mostly towards a healthcare model. Mm. Now, this is one option to move in. But then as the bottom of this is, uh, if you're moving into a data scientist role, you need to be really good in math. Mm. Math is the most primary requirement than anything else. But, and also obviously your analytical skills. Mm. So this is a question you will have to ask yourself. What is that is going to interest you? But uh, what is, yeah, uh, just a follow up question. Maybe, 
Yeah, yeah, just a follow-up question. Don't you think that you know moving towards this sector made you you know you have become ready for the future as well? You know, a lot of interesting things are coming up, and you will be a part of that. To be a part of a revolution in an industry is way bigger than you know being a part of the same old uh, industry. <laughs> Again, it depends on how you like to. I um, mean, how. In, the question is, do you enjoy yourself hmm. in what you are doing? So um, there are people who, I mean, I can give examples in the IT sector where there are, there is two ways. One is hmm. a set of people who would like to go up into the managerial role where they want to basically be a people manager hmm. or do the analytics or whatever. And then there is a set of people who are the developers. Hmm. Uh, at some point of time, these guys will be getting the same amount of salary. Or the levels, or the respect, everything remains the same. Okay. The question is, what do you like to? Uh, I mean, but over this period of time, are you happy doing these things? Definitely, you need to be aware of technology for sure. But mm. what technology and uh, how much level you have to indulge in this is a purely personal question. You cannot also not avoid technology. True. You should be aware of it. Yeah, so uh, I don't know whether I answered the question or uh, further complicated your. No, 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 it's fine. I mean, look, uh, at the end of the day, what you said was correct that your passion also matters. But in whatever you do, you should have that passion as well because you know a path is okay, everyone has a path, but then you know to have a passion driven career is way more important than having a you know path driven. It's career. not also necessary that you would be able to. Uh, uh, be passionate about or excited about your job every other minute. But think of it over a longer period, you might be happy. Because every day you would have your good days and bad days. And uh, But yes, uh, do something which is actually, which actually excites you. Mm. 